Good day, everyone. Uh, different parts of the world, so different parts of the day, so I would just say day. Um, it's a true honor uh, to have been invited as one of the closing speakers of this conference, and I would really like to thank Madhumati Deshpande and the other organizers for the very kind invitation and also for the splendid and very kind organization of this conference, as you all have uh, also witnessed just now. It's not only I who was accommodating, I think Madhumati Deshpande was very kind to me and my struggles with technology that are still ongoing, by the way, because I'm having a sort of weird thing with my computer, but we will, we will see how that goes. Um, I don't think there are many people among the audience today um, that I know personally, and it's of course a, a big pity that we don't get to talk a little bit more after the conference and have a chat over something to drink, but we will, um, it's nevertheless very nice uh, to meet you. So Professor Despande invites me to talk about my work on populism, obviously, and more specifically about an article I co-wrote a number of years ago with uh, Aurélien Mondon and Jason Kleines entitled Critical Research on Populism, Nine Rules of Engagement. Now, we wrote this article in response to a call for papers from a journal called Organization, which is a, a European British journal on critical management and organization studies. And in this call for papers in 2017, approximately after Trump and Brexit, when everybody was speaking about populism all the time, they indicated that management and organization studies should engage with populism more. And they invited a special issue with lots of papers about populism, organization and management. Um, and me nor my uh, co-authors um, work on management and organization, but we, we got to know about this call. And the first thing we thought was, wait, not so fast. Um, we were a bit skeptical of this call for papers, in fact. Would the study of management and organization really benefit from engaging with populism and using the concept of populism? If so, under what conditions would this engagement with populism be useful to that field? And what kind of conceptualization of populism could be relevant to that? And also, do, did we or do we really need more work on populism at all? Haven't we talked enough about it already? So this was our initial reaction um, to this. And so what we tried to do in response to this call for papers, not being management and organization scholars at all, was to, to formulate a number of starting points that could serve as a basic set of assumptions and questions that might help scholars who want to work on populism in whatever field, um, actually, not only in management and organization studies, but more generally. Um, and so what we did was formulate what we called, uh, using a bit of military language, uh, rules of engagement. So when should we engage with populism and how should we engage with populism? And we tried to formulate these across disciplines. And we think, or we hope the paper was relevant for student, students of politics, communication studies, cultural studies, economy, management, etc. Many of the disciplines that are also present uh, here today. So I'm, I know that I'm speaking to a very diverse audience um, today, and I hope my, my, my talk will be relevant to, to most of you, or to some of you at least. The structure of my argument will be very simple. It says nine rules of engagement. I will discuss the nine rules of engagement one by one, and then end with a number of broader conclusions or questions about academic research on populism, asking also a number of maybe uncomfortable questions to people like me who work on populism, and I wanted to ask myself some uncomfortable questions, and in doing so, perhaps also some of you. So these are the nine rules of engagement. Let me just start with the first one immediately. So, Manu, you can go to the, the next slide. So the first rule, the first rule of engagement um, is that populism is a concept and a signifier. Now, what do we mean by this? Populism as a concept means that populism the term populism, the concept of populism is a tool we use to understand a particular aspect of social reality. This is pretty obvious. It has a number of consequences. It means that a concept, as a concept, it needs to be sharp and precise. If we want to do something with it, it has to be, has to have a precise meaning, a sharp meaning. It cannot mean just anything, right? If we want a good definition, it needs to be abstract enough to cover all kinds of different populisms across the world, left and right, et cetera, et cetera but also specific enough so that it captures what is specific about populism, right? Populism is not all kinds of other things. So that's the concept. This is pretty obvious. I think all of us agree with this. 
we might disagree about the exact definition, but the idea that the concept needs to be precise, I think we all agree with that. Now, the second idea is that populism is also a signifier. And this is something else. This means that populism, the term populism, is not only a concept used by academics, it's also a signifier that occurs in all kinds of discourses, political discourse, media discourse, and academic discourse, right? It's not a neutral term. It's a term that's often used with very negative connotations, sometimes with more positive connotations, but the negative is more dominant. This is important for us to be aware of when we study populism, to be aware of our own normative assumptions, to be aware of the fact that we are participating in a discourse that is much broader than all of us, that media are talking about, that politicians are talking about, etc. And we need to be aware of the role we play in this, right? We need to be aware of the politics of the signifier populism, perhaps also study the, the politics of the signifier populism as some people are doing. So that's the first rule. Now, there are nine rules of engagement, as you can see. Rules two to five have to do with the concept, what is populism and what is populism not. That's, those are rules two to five. Remember, rules six to nine have more to do with the signifier. So I will go through this chronologically from two to nine. So, Madhu, please, if we could go to rule number two. Populism is a political logic. What does this mean? This is a term that comes out of discourse uh, theory, the work of Laclau and Mouffe, people like that. That's not what I want to talk about today. But what's important in populism as a political logic is two things mainly. First of all, populism is something political. This is pretty obvious, but quite some research into populism looks at populism as the consequence of socio-economic or socio-cultural changes. Poverty, low education, resentment, etc., etc., etc. This is all very important, obviously, but it is crucial to understand that populist politics, they do something. They do not just translate what exists in society objectively into the political sphere. No, they stimulate certain demands, they make people think about certain things, they politicize certain things, that might not have been politicized before. They bring together people, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to see that populism is something political and not just the consequence of sociological changes. Yeah, Donald Trump is not just the consequence of sociological factors in the US. There is much more to it than that, right? Without Trump, that wouldn't have existed. Yeah, so that's one part of it. The second element here is that populism, in, in how we see it, is not an ideology. It's not a set of ideas about how the world should work, but it's a specific way of formulating and bringing together all kinds of political demands and of positioning that po the populist in the political landscape. Yeah, so it's a certain way of doing politics. If you go to the next slide, uh, Madhu, I will give a, a brief definition as we saw it. So what we said is that populism is a political logic that opposes the people to the elite. This is very obvious, everybody knows this. Along the lines of a down-up antagonism, this is a bit more precise here, in which the people is discursively constructed as a large powerless group through opposition to the elite, which is conceived as a small and illegitimately powerful group. There are a number of important terms here, the people and the elite, everybody knows. The down-up antagonism stresses that this has to do with hierarchy and power. There can be all kinds of different hierarchies in power, but it's important that it's down-up. And what's important here from a discursive perspective is that both the people and the elite are discursively constructed. They do not just simply exist in society. Not all populists have the same definition of the people and the same definition of the elite. So there is an element of discursive construction here. And what populists do is claim to represent the people against this illegitimate elite that frustrates their demands. And what they also do, populists, they present their own demands as expressions of the will of the people. Again, what this will of the people is, that depends on the kind of populism we are dealing with. That's not just a given that is politically constructed. So that's what we mean by populism is a political logic. Secondly, or thirdly, actually, um, and this has to do with the precision of the definition, our idea was that there are many things that populism is not. Um, this sounds a bit obvious, but if you look at the literature and even more so journalistic debates and so on and so on, populism means all kinds of things. 
And we wanted to stress that populism is something specific. It's this political logic we just uh, described. But there are all kinds of things that populism is not. Populism is not just a popular way of talking for politicians. Then almost every politician would be a populist. Yeah. Populism is not the same as demagoguery or opportunism, as Kasmudo already said long ago, because we already have the terms demagoguery and opportunism, so we don't need populism for that. It's not just that. Not every populist is a demagogue, not every demagogue is a populist. They might often occur together, but that they are different things. Populism is not just political outsiders. There are only certain kinds of political outsiders that are populists, and sometimes populists are not really outsiders at all. Populism is not a synonym for authoritarianism. They might again occur together, but they are different things. You can be authoritarian without being a populist and you can be populist without being authoritarian. Populism is not the same as the radical right. Some radical right parties are not populist. Some radical right movements, especially have very little to do with populism. And not all populists are radical right, obviously. Populism is also not the same as nationalism. I will briefly uh, discuss that in a little bit more detail if we go to the next slide, uh, Madhu. So I worked a little bit on, on populism and nationalism also, trying to distinguish the two from each other because they are very often confused. There are good reasons for this, which has to do with the fact that both talk about the people, both talk about the sovereignty of the people. But beyond those similarities, populism and nationalism are very different things. Nationalists claim to speak in the name of the people as a nation, they address people as citizens of the nation. And if you look at how they define the nation, you can see that the nation is defined in opposition or at least in distinction from people who are not part of the nation or other nations. Let's say for the Belgian context, it would be Belgians are not the Dutch, are not the French, are not the Germans, for example, but also perhaps not uh, immigrants from the Maghreb. Yeah. So this is how nationalism works. And so if you try to look at this in a sort of architectural way or a spatial way, you see that nationalism has a sort of horizontal in-out distinction between people who belong to the nation and people who don't. Yeah, There is a very territorial dimension to this. Now, populism works very differently. It addresses people as members of the underdog, yeah? not as the nation, but as the underdog. And the opposition of the, or the opposite of the underdog is the elite or the establishment. So we have to do what we are seeing here is a vertical uh, sort of opposition that has to do with power, hierarchy, recognition, sometimes wealth, sociocultural position. There are all kinds of, 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 of options here, but it's not a horizontal um, opposition. It's a vertical opposition. That's the idea we developed in, in this kind of paper. So that's just one, one, one example of something populism is not. Populism is not the same as nationalism. The two often happen together or occur together. But if we want to understand the role of populism, for example, in the populist radical right, we have to know that populism is something specific and not just everything. So that's basically that. So rule number four, this is very closely related to what I said already. Populist politics are never only populist. Yeah. So we need to study how the populist dimension is articulated with non-populist dimensions. So no politics is only populist. And that also means that the concept of populism is never enough to approach any populist politics. The notion of populism allows us to see a certain dimension, but we are missing all kinds of things if we only look at that dimension. And it makes very little sense to only look at that dimension. For example, if we want to understand the role of populism on the radical right, we need to see how populism is combined with sort of ultra-nationalism, even racism, yeah? And then you will start to see that in on the populist radical right, the notion the people as underdog only refers to a sort of subgroup of the nation, yeah? Ordinary people who come from another country are not part of that, right? If you look at how they oppose the elite, you will see that what are the reasons for the radical right to oppose the elite? Well, they are too open to Muslims, they are too open to immigration, they are multiculturalist, globalist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the problem with the elite, according to the radical right. So this is what we need to look at. If we look at the left, the problems with the elite are very different. They have to do with socioeconomic factors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is important. Rule four: Populist politics are never only populist. So if we study them, the notion of populism is never enough. That's basically what that means. 
yeah, we can, I already explained that, so we can skip that one. So the rule number five is closely related to this, but it's more about the normative dimension. Populism in itself is neither good nor bad. Populism, and that also means that the term populism is never enough to evaluate populist politics. Yeah. When you look at whether a populism is democratic or undemocratic or progressive or conservative, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the notion of populism does not tell you so much. The question is, are we dealing with a populism that articulates left-wing demands or progressive demands, or are we dealing with very right-wing demands? Is populism used to democratize a very problematic, undemocratic situation? Is it used to overthrow an authoritarian regime, for example? Or is populism used to establish an authoritarian regime or to protect an authoritarian leader from criticism? Yeah? These are very, very different situations. And again, this means that if we want to normatively evaluate the relation between politics and uh, populism and democracy, for example, we cannot rely on the concept of populism alone because it does not tell us enough. So that's basically rule number five. So now we will move to the second set of rules, which is a bit of a pretentious term, of course, I'm sorry about that. But we are dealing here with another set of rules that has to do with the signifier populism. So the first part was about what is a useful definition of populism to approach political reality. The second set of rules has to do with, wait, we have to be aware of the fact that everybody's talking about populism and that when we talk about populism, we are also participating in very political debates, right? So these are the next set of rules. So rule number six is that we should study discourses about populism and their performative effects. This means that Populism is not only a concept, but also a signifier, and we need to be aware of that and perhaps also study it. We need to ask ourselves, why do we talk so much about pop uh, populism in academia, but also why do politicians talk so much about populism? Why do media talk so much about populism? What do these politics, what do these discourses about populism look, look like? Who uses the term populism? Why? What are they trying to do when they are using the term populism? Are they dismissing opponents? Are they dismissing the radical left or the radical right? Are they actually talking about racism? Are they mocking certain people, et cetera, et cetera? These are things we need to be very aware of. And we also need to think about the effects of how we talk about populism. For example, uh, I remember during the, the Greek crisis, I'm not sure how many of you know that, that context, but let's say after the financial crisis, there was a populist government in Greece that opposed the austerity measures of the European Commission and the, and the IMF and so on and so on. And they were very much criticized as populist, right? Now, what was happening there? We, we can ask some very critical questions about what was happening there, right? In that case, we could ask ourselves, was this government really a democratic problem or was the response of the European Commission and the, 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 the IMF and so on, was that the democratic problem, right? So we need to ask ourselves what is happening when people are speaking about populism, and we need to be uh, sometimes very critical of what is happening there. So rule number seven, which is an elaboration of what I was just saying, we should analyze anti-populism as a po po political logic. If you look at academic work, but even more so political discourse and journalistic discourse, populism is usually an insult or a critical term. So the anti-populist position is very dominant. There are also people who are pro-populist, especially in academia, but not so many. So we need to ask ourselves, when people are criticizing populism, what are they actually doing? What kind of status quo are they defending? Are they defending liberal democracy against populism? Are they defending rational political discourse against emotionality? Are they defending technocracy against ordinary people? Are they perhaps lumping together the radical left and the radical right as one big populist threat to sort of centrist democracy? So these are questions that we need to be very aware of. And we might also want to ask ourselves how this anti-populist rhetoric, how it attracts people, how it grips subjects, as, as Jason Kleinis has said. And there is certainly a risk of elitism in many critiques of populism and of the people who vote for populists. They are sometimes considered as emotional, which is then apparently a problem, as if the rest of the world is not emotional, stupid, 
etc etc whereas the elite or the people who see themselves as knowing better are rational scientific moderate etc etc sometimes there is something to these criticisms of course but sometimes we need to be a bit more critical of the assumptions underlying this kind of anti-populism there has been recently some kind some interesting work on this so there are some names there for example thomas frank who wrote a book with the with a fantastic title which is the people know that's the title of his book fantastic speaker too so if you ever get to see him speak he will talk to you about this anti-populism in the us in much detail showing its history and so on and so on and how it has always almost served as a way for the rich to protect themselves from actual democratic politics that would endanger their interests yeah so this is something to be very aware of and also to be careful when we are criticizing populism um, to be aware of what we are doing and what kind of politics we might be uh, associating or aligning ourselves with so this is this is rule number seven two two more rules to go so rule number eight we should study populist hype and its effects. This notion of hype comes from an article by Jason Glynis and Aurélien Mondon, who I later worked with, but they already used the, 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 uh, the, the, the name before. So they said there is a sort of hype about populism. It's like a fashion. It's everywhere. Everybody's talking about it, and more and more people are talking about it, and it kind of spirals out of control until everything is about populism, to put it a bit crudely. Um, now, all this talk about populism, there are many reasons for that. Some, one part is, of course, that there, there are very significant forms of populist politics that we need to attend to. So I'm not saying here that we shouldn't speak about it. I'm saying that there is more to it than that. So the, let's say, for example, in academic work, the rise of populism as a concept is not purely a, a reflection of what is happening in political reality. It also has dynamics of its own. Partly these dynamics are ideological, what I just mentioned. Many people use the term populism to criticize certain forms of politics, for example. Yeah? But there are also other dynamics to this that have to do with, the, with for example, uh, journalists read other journalists who are speaking about it and they also speak about it. So there's a sort of bandwagon effect. There is basically a, an element of hype or fashion there where people start to talk about it because other people are also starting to talk about it. And we need to be very aware of these dynamics as well. Why are we talking about populism? Is it because we think people will listen to us? Is it because we know that when we use that term, our articles will be read more? What are we doing? So this is important to know. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't use the term. I'm just saying we should be aware of why we are using it and why sometimes we might not want to use it because it's not the most appropriate term. So this is rule number eight. And rule number nine, is basically an application of this to academic discourse more specifically, yeah? So we should reflect more on academic discourse about populism is what we said in our article. First of all, we should reflect on its ideological dimension, what I said before, you know, the, the anti-populism, the normative elements of the thin ideology definition versus the more discourse theoretical definition, which where the thin ideology definition is much more critical of populism, Whereas people such as Chantal Mouffe would see populism as the solution to the problems with democracy, very different ideological position. But, and this was our contribution here, we should also look beyond ideological um, dimensions and ask ourselves how all ideological dimensions contribute to the ubiqu ubiquity of talk about populism. So the people who are pro-populist or anti-populist or a bit of both, all of them contribute to the fact that there is more and more debate about populism. And so we might want to ask ourselves also, what are the reasons for this ubiquity? In some cases, there are sometimes quite mundane reasons. For example, if the European Commission launches a call for millions of euros of research funds to address the problem of populism, that will lead to a lot of research on populism, right? And as academics, we need to be very aware of that. What are the politics of the Commission here? What are they doing? Do we want that money, right? Why is that pushing us to do that research? What is the political agenda behind this? So these are important questions. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't use the term populism, but we should be aware of why we are using it, when we are using it, and sometimes also when we should perhaps not use it. Yeah. So this is the, the last um, rule. 
And then I think I have one more slide um, with a few repercussions of these nine rules for academic work about populism. I wrote an article with Jason Glynis, I think it was published last year. It was called Beyond Populism Studies. And now, what we wanted to do with that article was not to say, please, everybody stop talking about populism. But what we wanted to do was put, put populism in its right place. So we wanted to stress again, like, yes, this is a useful concept. Yes, it elucidates a particular dimension of contemporary politics. But we need to use it modestly and precisely. So that means in combination with other concepts and only use the term populism to capture the populist dimension of politics. And only then is the term populism useful. Some forms of politics have nothing to do with populism. We shouldn't be using the term populism when we look at them. Yeah. Now this beyond populism argument, the light version of the argument is that all research on populism should use other concepts as well. So not just populism. Yeah, that's the light version. And much, much of the work on populism already does this very well. But there's also perhaps more far reaching consequences of the argument, um, which is that we also need to sometimes consider very carefully whether the use of the term populism is useful in a certain context at all. Does this really what we are looking at? Is it really about populism or is it or is there a better term to use here? Is this about nativism? Is it about authoritarianism? Then why not speak about that instead? So this is this is another aspect of that. And what we wanted to stress very much is that our argument was a bit of an argument against the field of populism studies, which is a sort of field that revolves around the notion of populism. And we felt that this field has had some very good production in the last years, but that we've reached a point where we need to reintegrate questions about populism into more substantive fields, which can be substantive political traditions, the radical right, the radical left, and so on and so on, and broader questions, for example, the study of democracy, etc. So our argument was also a critical questioning of the, the legitimacy of the field called populism studies, where we felt that a field that revolves only around populism has a number of very serious problems that we need to be very careful with. So everyone, I will um, stop talking here. There are a number of publications that if you're interested in my work on populism and nationalism, there are a number of articles there. And then on the next slide, there are some uh, articles that are more about the politics of the notion of populism and this argument beyond populism studies. If you find me online on the university website or something, you can find all of this also on ResearchGate. You can download most of it. If there's something you cannot find, just send me an email and I will send you uh, the PDF. Don't worry about it. So that was it for me. I hope this was uh, interesting to you.